I'd like to now ask Lynn Salva to share a few words on behalf of the Stag's Leap wine cellars and the Antonori family. Glenn is responsible for all the wine growing activities at Antonori Napa Valley, as well as supports other Antonori ventures located in the New World, including Stag Leap Wine Cellars. Right after Glenn speaks, we're going to show a fun four minute clip of Warren and Julia together on a January 1984 uh, episode from the Dinner at Julia's TV series. So enjoy that as well. Glenn? Yeah, thank you, Eric, and good evening, everybody. It's uh, great to have everybody here tonight at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars for Piero Antonori and his family, and our family here at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. We welcome you uh, to this beautiful place that both Warren and Barbara, and we also have Stephen and Julia here tonight, created, and that the Antonori family were um, fortunate enough uh, to carry on that legacy. Um, being stewards of the land here for Stag's Leap Wine Cellars is an incredible responsibility. Uh, we did a short tour of the winery, which is uh, so incredible and so beautiful. But um, for all wines, they come from great vineyards, and it's the vineyards that we weren't able to see tonight uh, right outside the door here. Uh, the SLV Vineyard, of course, that uh, brought fame to Stag's Leap Wine Cellars with the Paris Tasting in 1976. And then um, shortly after that, um, the purchase of the Fay Vineyard uh, that um, is also part of the legacy of, of Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. Uh, for the Antonori family, uh, we have a rich history back in Tuscany. Uh, we date back to uh, 1385 when we were registered as a wine producing family by the Florentine Wine Guild. Uh, today, we're 26 generations of uh, family ownership um, in the wine business. Uh, we had a small stake here in Napa Valley before um, taking on Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. Um, it's a beautiful property in the Atlas Peak um, AVA of Napa Valley. But for uh, Piero Antonori and Warren, uh, they were great friends. And uh, back in 2006, uh, we were presented the opportunity to uh, take on the legacy of Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. Um, at that time, it was a little bit more than uh, what the family was able to uh, take on. But just this past summer, we uh, closed the loop where we took full ownership. And it's one of those rare occasions uh, here in Napa Valley where a winery that started with an incredible family uh, went sort of corporate, uh, but now we've brought it back to family. And um, I think it will stay there forever and ever and ever. So with that, um, good evening. Nice having you all here. It's going to be an incredible evening in tribute to uh, Warren and his accomplishments. And uh, it's so great to have you here. So welcome. Thank you. of the Stag's Leap Wine Cellars in Napa Valley. And we have a marvelous visiting chef, Louis Evans Jr. from the Pontchartrain Hotel in New Orleans. And our guests are munching on little tiny buckwheat pancakes, little blinis, and rather than being covered with caviar, which is getting rather old hat nowadays, this has a delicious sour cream with chopped chives and green onions. And while everyone's doing that and drinking Warren's delicious Riesling, come on out in the kitchen. I want to show you what's going on. Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. Its wines came in first over some notable French wines at a historic Paris tasting in 1976. Some would say that single event put California wines on the map to stay. And the man responsible for that is Warren Winiarski. Warren, we're just so delighted that you're here today. Thank you, Julia. What have you brought us? I have a number of wines, and I'll go through them in the course of the menu. Uh, for the Blinney, uh, mm -hmm. I've got a Napa Valley White Riesling. Mm -hmm. It has a slight sweetness to it, but balanced by a fairly good 
acid, and I think it'll do well. It doesn't have the grip mm -hmm. uh, that a dry wine would have for for a aperitif. This will be a nice caviar, blini wine. I hope it'll work out. Oh, good. For good. the beef course, I've got uh, Napa Valley Merlot from Stag's Live Vineyards, the state bottled wine. It's a wine that uh, is softer and more and and a little less muscular than than the Cabernet. We're beginning to see more Merlot, it seems to me. You're right. I think it's gaining in popularity. It's because it is a little lighter and softer. Lighter and more mild, more moderate, more mm -hmm. more uh, open and more agreeable mm -hmm. wine. That'll be a good beef wine. I hope it'll work out. Uh, the crayfish course had me a little stumped for a while, well, it, so I'm. It did us too. We were wondering we're what you'd to come work up it with. Out. No, and we're... I've got a, a two wines for that, mm. uh, Julia. I've got a Napa Valley Gamay Beaujolais, which is a low acid, uh, mm -hmm. a moderate acid mm -hmm. wine, uh, but good fruit and mm -hmm. nice flavor. Very mm -hmm. agreeable uh, wine for uh, for a wide range of food. Some people drink it with a bouillabaisse, I think. Yes, they do. Do you and, think we uh, ought to so try that it out? So that led to the ambiguity. I think maybe yeah. if we try it, we can uh, make the decision I'm and then... Always uh, in favor of that. See what works yeah. out best. It's a lovely color. Mm. I love that. I love a Gamay Beaujolais. It's a particularly good one. Nice and mm. fruity, but mm. maybe that fruit would have a problem with the bisque, and so we have the second one. This is actually the first wine we've made of this type, uh, Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's more austere, so it would have the ef opposite effect of this. Not as fruity. Not well, quite as fruity, but more austere mm. and, and somewhat more acid. More tart, I should say. Mm -hmm. More crayfish. Biscuit, that it yeah. might have the tendency to counteract some of the richness. I think you're right, Warren. I think that's, I like that better with it. It's a little, I think this more one's amenable, too don't you think? Warren, thank you. I'm looking forward to tasting every one of these wines. Thank you, Julia. Oh boy. Um, first off, uh, Glenn, thank you. Thank you for your words. Really appreciate that. And wow, don't Julia and Warren uh, make a great team on the screen. Uh, and she did like her wine. Uh, that's for sure. On a personal note, um, I'm very fortunate to have known and considered both Julia and Warren to be close friends and mentors. So this is a special evening for me to have them all together. Um, as you know, Warren is not able to attend tonight's event, but boy oh boy, his presence is felt throughout. And as you can see, we are filming tonight's festivities, so Warren will be able to watch us and having a wonderful time doing that. So I want to first say hello, Warren. <laughs> So just, just a little over two weeks ago on Monday, February 12th, I had the honor of visiting Warren at his home just up the hill uh, from here and presented him the first ever Julia Child Foundation Trustee Medal of Honor. Uh, please watch this video of the presentation and Warren expressing his gratitude to everyone here tonight. Hello, I'm Eric Spivey, Chairman of the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. It is my incredible honor to present the first ever Julia Child Foundation Trustee Medal of Honor to my very good friend, Warren Vinyarski. This new award was established as a way for the trustees of the foundation to recognize the lifetime contributions of those who have made an enduring change in the field of gastronomy and the culinary arts. Julia held Warren in such high regard for his achievements in elevating wine and winemaking. By the way, this past fall was Warren's 60th harvest in the Napa Valley. Julia was a guest at Warren's home here in Napa, and Warren was a special guest for one of Dinner at Julia's television episodes, and it's wonderful to see their friendship be recognized once again. So, we proudly present Warren Vinyarski, the Trustee Medal of Honor, for decades dedicated to transformative change in the field of the culinary arts, 
which include food, wine, and aesthetics of the table, for being a mentor and role model in viticulture, winemaking, land preservation, and philanthropy within the Napa Valley and beyond, for collaborating and supporting many educational institutions, such as the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, St. John's College, and the University of California, especially at Davis. There is no one more deserving to be the first recipient of the Julia Child Foundation Trustee Medal of Honor than my dear friend, Warren Vinyarski. Thank you, Eric. And uh, I was doing what I like to do, so it was no burden. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think Julia and I both realized that to take wine and food, we're not talking about chemistry, food as chemistry, we're talking about food as something beautiful, and I'm talking, I was trying to talk about wine as something beautiful from the position that it found itself in, in, in um, prohibition, it was booze. And wine at its best, wine can be booze, but at its best, it is something elevating, and it makes, it makes a contribution to something in the human soul that we all recognize something beyond uh, the limitation which the, the, the generic thing, mm -hmm. food, wine, is beyond that because it offers an opportunity for the human soul to see something much beyond the chemistry of food. Yes. So we were doing what we like yeah. to do. <laughs> <laughs> and doing what we like to do always makes it more pleasant. And uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity for this particular event to take place and for the opportunity to share those thoughts with you by some of the people who will be speaking to you during the course of the evening. And uh, I'm disappointed, of course, that I can't be with you myself. I'll be with you in spirit, however, and I'll be sharing the thoughts with you as we go on through the evening uh, by having the opportunity to see what the actual run of show <laughs> <laughs> was. Yeah, run of show. Let me just put this around you right now, Warren, because we really want everyone to be able to see uh, this first reward presentation of, to anybody in the world about the Trustee Medal of Honor from the Julia Child Foundation. We thank you for being the first recipient. Yeah. We love you, <laughs> and we just are so happy this is happening, even though you won't be able to attend the actual event on February 29th. Yeah. Thank you but so I'll much. But I'll be there friend. with you. You bet. I'll always, be there with always. you. Always. Thank you. And thank you for the honor that does include the culinary arts. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. In order to elevate wine, we had to bring it together with food. That elevation at a national institution was the way to do it. I now want to ask Carla Jensen to briefly speak about uh, the Julie-inspired meal for the evening and then ask Luis Contreras, the cellar master of Stagleap Wine Cellars, to share details around the selection of these amazing wines and the intentional pairing with the food. So Carla and Luis, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carla Jensen, the director of special events here at Stagleap Wine Cellars. And I'd like to tell you about the menu, uh, which was inspired by some of Julia's most iconic dishes. I hope you're enjoying our potage pimentier, a creamy and velvety potato and leek soup, which is our version of Julia's simple yet elegant vichyssoise. Next, we have the roasted guinea hen a l'orange, 
a tender and juicy bird marinated in a zesty orange sauce and roasted to perfection. This dish pays, pays homage, homage to Julia's classic roast chicken, but with a twist of citrus for a burst of flavor. For the main course, we present a deconstructed beef bourguignon. Tender pieces of beef are braised in a rich and savory red wine sauce, accompanied by spring onions, mushrooms, and carrots. This dish captures the essence of Julia, Julia's timeless beef stew, but with a modern and artistic presentation. We hope you enjoy this culinary journey through some of Julia's most beloved recipes. Bon appetit. Thank you, Carla. Welcome, everyone. My name is Luis, and I'm part of the winemaking team here at Staxley Wine Cellars. Uh, wine has the potential to create beautiful memories. We use wine for special events, for celebrations with food, it opens opportunities for many, many people in different areas in the industry. And also, uh, it goes really well with food. <laughs> and it has become part of our culture now more and more. When uh, we talk about wine, about vintages, right? Oh, it was a great vintage. It was a different vintage than expected. So even though a lot of winemakers that are here, we all agree that we are the mercy of Mother Nature. There is only so much we can do with the grapes that we get presented. In so right now, what we're gonna have during dinner is gonna be three vintages. Each vintage, each vintage is gonna be one decade apart, starting with, with the 98, 2008, in 2018. So just to give you a little snapshot of how the vintages were back then, and uh, Michael can, can collaborate with me on that and agree, uh, it was like the transition from El Nino to the Niña, when it was the weather pattern, so a lot of water, and a very, very cool vintage. But again, uh, when we talk about vintage, and part of the, the winemakers is to capture a snapshot of that vintage and make the best wine possible. Still an essence of that vintage and the weather pattern is still captured on the bottle of wine. So then we move to 2018, 2000, sorry, 98, 2008. It was like, it was very, very cold and it was for about 20, 22 days frost potential. So all the vineyard workers and vineyard managers were like on their toes, just, being, being prepared and, uh, to take care of the, of the uh, uh, frost equipment, to prevent frost. And that created another, another style of wine as well. And 2018, it was, uh, it was a very good vintage. It was uh, our winemaker, Marcus says, it was uh, uh, the perfect vintage for the winemaker. Everything was nice, temperature was staying steady, the, the vintage was prolonged, so it gave time, it gave a, uh, time for the grapes to hang longer. So it created uh, another kind of wine. So the wine that we're having tonight with our dinner, it is Cast 23, which is the blend of our two historical vineyards, SLB and Fay, put together. Uh, SLB contributes to beautiful structure, red fruit, and Fay, beautiful polished tannins and beautiful uh, aromas, uh, perfume aromas. So we blend those two together into Cast 23. So again, uh, if you have the opportunity, save a little wine on each. I know it's gonna be really hard, <laughs> but save a little wine of each vintage so you have the opportunity to taste wine 10 years and 10 years and 10 years after. All right, so enjoy. Thank you. Um, we are exceedingly excited that we have three legendary mentees of Warren's that will be speaking tonight uh, in order of when they worked for Warren. So you'll first hear by video from John Williams, who unfortunately could not attend tonight, and then John Kungsgaard, and then finally Michael Salachi. So we've got three legends that are gonna ta tell their personal stories that are at least they're allowed to tell <laughs> in a public audience uh, about Warren. Uh, I won't announce when uh, 
John and the two Johns get up and speak. They'll get up without me speaking because you'll get tired of hearing me. Uh, but know that we're going to be in for some very good stories in just a moment. And I think we're going to start with John Williams. Hey, Warren, John Williams here. Sorry I can't be with you all tonight. Uh, you know, it's February 29th, leap year day, and that's, a, that's like a national holiday here at Frog's Leap, so a lot on my hands. But I, I did want to offer my congratulations uh, to uh, winning the Julia Child Foundation Trustee Medal of Honor. I mean, that's got to be like the biggest thing you've won since Paris. So I'm thrilled for you. It's really, really cool and excited that you are getting the recognition you deserve for your unbelievable contributions to, uh, to our valley, to our industry, to so many young professionals who've mentored under you, uh, to the ag, your work on the Ag Preserve. I mean, it just the list goes on and on and on. It makes me really proud uh, to be uh, considered your friend. Um, I, I, sorry, I can't be there tonight, but I wanted to uh, let you know that I'm, I'm down with raising some money for the Smithsonian. So we donated a little lot. I hope it sells for a lot of money. Uh, I'm gonna throw in a few uh, special things to the right person who buys that. And so uh, let's run, uh, raise some money for the Smithsonian. But I just wanted to say, you know, when you and Barbara brought me into your family, into Stag Sleep in 1975, spring of 1975. It changed my life and you've changed the lives of so many young people who you've mentored and, and brought into this profession. And uh, I just wanted to thank you personally. Uh, you and Barbara made a huge change in my life and I really appreciate it. I, I love you. I hope you have a great evening. Uh, congratulations on the honor uh, from uh, the Julia Child Foundation and Hey, let's have lunch soon. I'll buy this time. Good evening. I'm very honored to be here. I'm John Kongsgaard. I had the pleasure of working for Warren uh, when I was a college kid. There's a tradition at Davis um, where the the great winemakers would take in the fledglings and I was part of that program in the 1977 vintage just just after my friend John Williams was there um, so I want to say one thing very earnestly first is don't change the exhibition at the Smithsonian very much but maybe expand it because I was there for the first time a couple of years ago, you go past Julia's kitchen, that's the most fun thing imaginable. And I walked into that little corner there and my whole education was right there in one panel. Because my first teacher was Nathan Fay, who actually encouraged Warren through his wines to come to this part of the valley. And so there was in the same panel Warren and Nathan and Andre Chelichev, who was my old friend and also my teacher only in the sense that he um, was working for Warren and I was the little dog trotting around behind those guys overhearing everything. Andre, in fact, encouraged me to, he was lived in our neighborhood uh, in Napa and he encouraged me to grow Chardonnay when that was not so common. Um, well, let me say that I'm really especially glad for this opportunity because we had a similar thing where Warren was honored by the Wine Library. And John Williams and a whole bunch of us got up there. And I felt really awful after my little thing because I had three minutes and I just told some jokes about what it was like to work for Warren. And there were a lot of jokes to tell, but I won't bother myself with that or you. Um, <clears throat> but what I should have talked about was my friendship with Warren, which I would like to address tonight. So. I worked for Warren for three and a half months in 1977. And I went on to make Chardonnay, which is not what he's famous for. My Cabernet is nothing like what you guys do. I learned a little bit. But um, the main thing I want to say is that um, from that little experience with Warren and Barbara, um, I was part of the family, like John said. Uh, my first job was to put a little linoleum floor down in the Mexican worker house uh, 
and my next job was to pick the kids up from the bus stop. <laughs> so I thought, I am family. <laughs> I didn't really feel like I worked there at all until things, till things got going. Um, anyway, Warren and Barbara and I remained friends. That was 47 years ago. I just did the math. That's two, two thirds of my life and half of Warren's life. We've been absolutely buddies. And part of that was through our common interest in books and music, especially music, because I have a, my hand in the music situation in Napa. <clears throat> Warren and Barbara often came to our concerts. Um, and my, my actually favorite memory of Barbara is when she was in a, she was not in a wheelchair, but she had a sort of a walker thing that she could push along and then sit on if she needed to. And everybody loved Barbara. I mean, everybody loved Barbara in Napa, and especially in the music community. And Barbara would, Warren would kind of break the path in through the room where everyone was, everyone was gathered before the concert, and Barbara with her head down, just not looking at anybody, charging through, and we all <laughs> leapt out of the way. And then people would very kindly lay her, set her down into her seat, and everyone came to them at the intermissions, and she always had something to say. It's worth remembering that her maiden name was Dvorak, like the composer. And I never could say Dvorak correctly around Barbara. She always, <laughs> always corrected me. It was, there was a better way to say it. Anyway, so I don't want to talk about Warren as my mentor. He certainly was to some degree, but that would be a wild exaggeration. And I just want to talk about this friendship. And it went on over the years often just through a phone call. And those of you who get phone calls or more, it's always the same. Hello, John is Warren. Please call my cell. And then he would give, you, give it to you. Like, I know the cell. And later in life, even the area code. Anyway, and so whatever the point was <clears throat> that he wanted to make, then I would say, so what else is up? And then there was always a little anecdote and I felt like he prepared them for me. So one I remember especially, not so long ago, is that he said, oh, well, since you asked, I had a total breakthrough in my, my, my Machiavelli studies. <laughs> I was working on a translation and something came to me and then he flattered me as if I had something, even a quarter of his intellect, and then went on for another 10 minutes about whatever this <laughs> fine point was that I had no business understanding. Anyway, that's just an example of how it goes, but <clears throat> I want to say that the most striking um, example of our friendship was in, in 2020, we lost our Chardonnay crop to the fire on Atlas Peak. And I called Warren um, and asked if, because of these rough circumstances, if he would sell us a press load or two of Chardonnay from this vineyard that I covet. It's the most perfect vineyard in, the Chardonnay vineyard anyway, in Napa, in Coombsville. And he said, of course. So he ran out there and chose the block and so on. And we picked up the grapes at four in the morning because it was a night pick. And sure as anything, this is like, Warren was already past 90, how he got his driver's license renewed. It was an <laughs> expression of his fortitude and really his strength in all ways. Anyway, Warren showed up at seven o'clock in the morning uh, unannounced, <clears throat> uh, just to make sure everything was okay. And he was watching the grapes being dumped out of the bin into the hopper, kind of with disdain that we didn't have a sorting table. He knew that, so he thought he told the guys really careful picking, and he wanted to make sure that was done correctly. So I said, well, here's the flashlight. He said, this is not a flashlight. He went out to his car and brought a proper flashlight so he could really see what was happening and then gave it to me. Just always trying to improve his students. Um, the short of this then is the place was just burned. There was every square meter was black and a lot of trees were falling over near the winery. And Warren came back into the winery after we thought he had left. And he was a little teary and he said to my son Alex and me, he said, this is terrible. How do you feel? And we said, you know, we're gonna get it. He said, I love you guys. I'm just gonna give you these grips. Oh to help you through your trial of the fire.
That doesn't happen in this business. And then one last one. <clears throat> this year in December, uh, we were in holiday in Hawaii and on the 28th, the, war, the phone rang from Warren and we were, did, I missed it. I called them back, missed each other. Finally, he called me at, on the on New Year's Eve and he said, uh, before the year is out, I just wanted to tell you how much our friendship means to me. Yeah. It's a blessing, said he. And so I would say to you, Warren is a blessing and let's take a lesson from him on how to be a friend. Thank you, John. That was so nice to hear and unsurprising in so many ways, but what a great man that Warren is, a great friend, wow. Um, unfortunately, Congressman Mike Thompson was unable to join us this evening, but thankfully he asked us to share this three minute video of his wonderful heartfelt message to Warren. Let's hear from Congressman Mike Thompson. Warren, congratulations on your well-deserved recognition as the recipient of the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and Culinary Arts first ever Medal of Honor. Your exceptional contributions to the wine community, your steadfast support for young vintners, and your dedication to the preservation of agricultural land are truly inspiring. Your journey in the world of wine, from the transformation of an old prune orchard into the renowned Stag's Leap wine cellars is a testament to your visionary spirit. Your ability to produce great wines, influenced by mentors like Lee Stewart, Robert Mondavi, and Andre Chelichev, has not only elevated the standards of winemaking, but has also set an enduring example for the entire industry. Your commitment to wine has not only resulted in award-winning wines, but it's also left an indelible mark on the wine community around the world. The judgment of Paris in 1976, where your Stag's Leap Cabernet triumphed, marked an historic moment for Napa Valley, and your dedication to the craft has continued to lead the way. Your legacy extends far beyond your winemaking ability. Your role in creating the nation's first agricultural preserve in 1968, safeguarding our Napa Valley's ag land from urban development, showcases your dedication to preserving the essence of viticulture. Your generosity, exemplified by donations to organizations like the Land Trust and your contributions to climate change research, highlights your commitment to our environment. And your initiatives to preserve the cultural heritage of winemaking, such as the establishment of the Winyarski Curator of Food and Wine History at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, and the collection of works by wine writers about California at the UC Davis Library underscores your passion for sharing the rich history of wine. Your impact in the wine world is immeasurable, and your legacy as a mentor, an innovator, and a conservationist will continue to inspire generations to come. Once again, congratulations on this incredible honor your contributions to our valley and the wine community cannot be overstated, and your impact will be remembered for generations to come. Thank you, my friend, and I hope to see you real soon. Okay, we're keeping the evening going. Um, food, will, the main will be out very soon, but we're gonna continue charging ahead. We have a lot to share. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the National Museum of American History now in Washington, D.C. It has been such an important partner of the Julia Child Foundation. Uh, in fact, the uh, Foundation Museum staff collectively and fondly call ourselves Team Julia. 
Um, so we really do work together as a team, and we feel like we're in this together. And a lot of it has to do with the good energy that Julia and Warren has provided uh, the food history exhibit. As you heard from Warren, he's so thankful for the generosity of everyone attending this evening with all the net proceeds from the dinner and silent auction going to support the Smithsonian Food History Project. The museum hosts roughly four to five million visitors a year, and these visitors learn about or, or are reminded about Julia and Warren's combined dedication to the historical interconnectedness of food and wine, which Warren himself talked about in the video earlier. The Judgment of Paris, organized by Stephen Spurrier on May 24, 1976, was a defining moment for California wines. The silent auction we're releasing tonight, I guess we don't have great Wi-Fi in here, so if you guys have tried, you may not be able to look at it, but we're gonna have a, essentially a week-long silent auction that's being released tonight um, with some amazing, amazing items. One of those is a signed bottle of Warren's famed 1973 Stag's Leap Wine Cellars Cabernet. So, Greg, get your pocketbook out. <laughs> Enrique, start bidding against them. The two of you guys. Um, no, uh, it's amazing. In fact, I, was so, I saw Warren today at four o'clock at his home, and he was doing really well. And he had that smile that he had on the screen. And he wanted me to know exactly how many bottles are left of that wine, the 1973 in his cellar and he couldn't remember. And uh, he knew within a bottle or two, but he wanted to make sure he was accurate. <laughs> and then he said, I'll call you, back to John's, I'll call you and leave you a message sort of thing. Um, and he did leave me like three messages because I wasn't picking up because I wasn't here, I had no coverage. But he wanted uh, everyone to know that he had 11 bottles in his cellar, but now he will only have 10 because this wine is being part of that auction. He's also gifted a magnum of 1993, so I guess 20 years after um, the Taste of Paris uh, tasting, they, um, of that wine that is engraved in the back, the magnum, and it's specially designed or made for Julia Child. And he's not sure why that happened. <laughs> But that's the last bottle that exists of that wine. And then there's just a tremendous amount of generosity from all the winemakers here in this room that have all gifted wine experiences and wines, typically both together, uh, that you should really go and look at. And, and if you're not bidding on it, blast it out to your friends and family and everybody else, because these are sort of unique things. And so there is a QR code somewhere a little piece of paper, put that in your pocket, take it home, don't forget about it. This auction will be going on for a while. Another item that we're offering tonight silent, in the silent auction is two, week, two weeks, uh, one week from tonight it ends. Not tonight. You don't have to go home tonight and bid, although you should. <laughs> and Greg, and, Greg and Enrique are going to start bidding pretty soon. So. <laughs> So true, so true. Um, anyway, uh, another thing we're offering in tonight's silent auction uh, is two tickets to attend the 10th anniversary of the Julia Child Award Gala at the museum on October 17, 2024, where all the past recipients of the Julia Child Award will be on stage together. Uh, along with that, uh, with the gala tickets, we're including a behind the scenes guided tour by the curator of the museum, Food History Project, of Julia's kitchen, Anne Warren's objects, that's what museums call things that you, you retain, uh, objects, uh, including the 1973 Cabernet that's there. Uh, so we hope many of you will decide to attend the fall event in, in DC in October. Uh, now it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Julie Flynn. Julie has a background in law and has dedicated her career advocating for environmental conservation, 
sounds like Warren, and social justice causes where she made an amazing, she's made an amazing impact. Julie joined the board of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History about a year ago after having been on the Smithsonian board for nine years? Nine years. So she's dedicated over 10 years of her life to the Smithsonian and the many great things that the museums underneath the Smithsonian do. Uh, so my wife, Cynthia, and I are fortunate to know Julie and her husband, Greg, through a YPO chapter in San Francisco we're both part of, we're all part of. So anyways, I am excited to have Julie speak on behalf of the museum this evening. Julie? Uh, good evening, and thank you for that very kind introduction, Eric. It's so great to be here in this beautiful space with wonderful people, great food, and of course, great wine. And so happy to be part of this uh, celebration honoring Warren. Sorry, can you, is this? We all at the museum wish him a full recovery, um, and thank you to the trustees of the Julia Child Foundation and to Eric Spivy for inviting me to speak, to say a few words. I'm honored to be speaking on behalf of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, where, as Eric said, I serve on the advisory board. I bring sincere greetings from the museum's director, Anthea Harding, and, the, and Paula Johnson, who's a curator of wine and food history at the museum. Thank you. They're sorry they could not be with us tonight, but they um, are here with us in spirit. I also bring greetings from the members of the museum's food history team. All of us from the museum send our very best wishes to Warren, along with our deep gratitude to him, to the Julia Child Foundation, and to all of you tonight for supporting the museum by attending. Thank you. So as Eric said, the National Museum of American History is the only museum in the country dedicated to telling the full history of the United States. We serve as the custodian of our national treasures and are honored to hold the public's trust for more than 1.7 million objects and a collection of over 22,000 linear feet of archival material. The museum welcomes millions of people to the building on the National Mall and also serves millions through their online programming. You may be familiar with some of the museum's most iconic objects, including the Star Spangled Banner, which is the original flag that flew over Fort, sorry, Fort McHenry in Baltimore uh, during the War of 1812 that inspired our national anthem. Also the writing desk that Thomas Jefferson used to draft the Declaration of Independence. And a section of the Greensboro lunch counter where four African-American college students launched the modern civil rights movement in 1960. I could go on, but I want to emphasize that among the treasures of the museum are many that are related to the wine and food history. And Warren has played a major role in making that happen. You see, back in the 1990s, Warren wondered whether there would be any national recognition of the 20th anniversary of the Judgment of Paris. 20 years had passed since Warren's Cabernet and Mike Burgage's Chardonnay placed ahead of the best of France in a blind tasting held in Paris. We all know the incredible impact that had on the history of American wine and winemaking. The Paris tasting is the watershed moment when it became clear to an international audience that the new American wines from California were not only competitive, but superlative. Within those 20 years, from 1976 to 1996, the American wine industry expanded ex exponentially, and by the turn of the century, wine was produced in all 50 states. The quality of wines from certain regions of the country gained notice around the world. So Warren wondered, what is happening to commemorate the 20th anniversary of this great historic event? So Warren made a few calls and eventually reached John Fleckner, the head archivist at the National Museum of American History. In 1996, the museum staff organized a public symposium, Red, White, and American, the History of Wine in America. The event included a recreation of the Paris tasting, a tasting of wines from some 20, 26 states, and speakers who discussed the long history of wine in this country. The excitement around this anniversary symposium led to many discussions about how the museum could add to its collections perhaps explore wine history in a future exhibition. Warren and his late, white bar late wife Barbara decided to help the museum get started by supporting a research and collecting initiative to build a foundation of knowledge. The family generously donated funds to develop an oral history project that would start, where else? In Napa. 
The funding allowed the team to conduct interviews with people who are part of the major transformation of the wine industry, as well as individuals who are creating their own visions about the production of wine in the United States. Over several years, they amassed an archive of recorded interviews, footage and photographs, and collected archival material and objects from many winemakers, as well as all parts of the industry in Napa and Sonoma. These materials are housed in the museum, where they are available to researchers and people from all over the world who come to learn about American wine history. And in 2012, the team opened a new exhibition that includes a major section about wine and winemaking. Warren, Julia Verniski, Michael Salachi, and others are featured in a video where they explain the finer points of how great wine starts in the vineyard. As time went on, the team's discussions with Warren took a turn toward food. They made plans to document the histories of ingredients, various dishes, and food-related traditions and technologies that are an essential part of life in America. Then, in 2001, when the team heard that Julia Child was leaving her longtime home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to return to her home state of California, the pieces were in place to request an interview with Julia herself. Within days, three staff members visited Julia at Cambridge, asked about her plans for the hundreds of objects in her kitchen, while also discussing the exciting work they were doing for the Food and Wine History Project. She was really happy to learn that food history was taken seriously at the National Museum of American History, and ultimately she decided to donate her kitchen and its contents. Like Warren, she understood that the museum would be an excellent caretaker for her culinary legacy and would share the wealth of objects and stories with the American public. And like the 1973 Stag Sleep Wine Cellars Cabernet and other materials collected from Warren, Julia Child's kitchen is on display in the exhibition Food, Transforming the American Table, where millions of people view it in person and online. And if you've not been there to see it at the museum, I highly recommend it. It's really a wonderful part of the museum. The Food History Project has continued to use the lens of food and drink to explore important stories in American history. In 2012, the team held its first winemaker's dinner, bringing together winemakers around a particular theme to speak about their history and their wines while enjoying a wonderful evening of food and wine to benefit the museum. Last April, we partnered with the Napa Valley Vintners for the Seven Such Dinner and had an unforgettable evening learning about sustainable practices and some of the climate-related changes in wine country. Since 2015, the team has also partnered with the Julia Child Foundation to host a gala in honor of the annual Julia Child Award recipient, and typically organizes scheduled events for the following days called Food History Weekend. The event brings hundreds of people into the museum to participate in talks, cooking demonstrations, and tours around a specific theme. Um, this coming, I think Eric mentioned, this coming gala next year in 2024 is going to be October 17th to 19th at the museum. Please mark your calendars. We'd love to see you all there. It's really a wonderful, wonderful event. Finally, we have found that our program model to address topics of relevance today by exploring their historical roots is a successful way of engaging diverse audiences and thinking about the future. Thanks to Warren and Barbara for their vision and their tremendous support over many years, food history is still bringing the public to the community table where education and engagement are always on offer. And with full hearts and boundless gratitude, let me acknowledge that the Verniskis have made a significant bequest to the museum to fund the Verniski Curator of Food and Wine Industry History, ensuring that this important work will continue with an endowed curatorial position. This is true leadership, and we are eternally grateful for our long relationship with Warren and his family. So again, thank you all so much, Eric, and trustees of the Jula Child Foundation, Stag Sleep Wine Cellars, and thank you all for listening to my story. We wanted to honor Warren um, and thank him for all of his support, and to all of you for being here to support the Smithsonian. Thank you. So I think a lot of you know who Chloe is. I know Julia does. Chloe is a cartoon character who represents Clover Stornetta. And these billboards in Napa, we would drive by and they had these really corny puns. And Warren would always break out laughing. I'm just telling you another side of Warren. And he thought they were extremely funny. And um, I found out that there was a book with all of the different billboards, all of these different um, puns with Chloe. And so I thought this would be a great birthday present for, for Warren. So I got a carton, a half gallon of milk, uh, and um, I grew up in a dairy, so I had to finish it. 
Um, so I got this carton and I created like a Easter basket of the Clover Stonetta uh, milk carton, got some tissue paper and put this book of puns in it, took it to Warren for his birthday, and he was examining the, the basket. And I was saying, come on, man, just get in there. And I said, there's no, there is a meaning to the carton, but you have to get under the tissue to really understand it. And uh, so he really enjoyed that book. And um, I just found it um, amazing how he had such a broad sense of humor. So I, uh, my name is Michael Sulaci. I, I, um, I had uh, 10 interviews with Warren and two take-home assignments to get the job I, uh, to, to become a social winemaker. And I worked about 40 hours on all, with the interviews and, and doing his, the uh, exam, uh, the, the, um, upper, the um, different questions he asked me to answer, the essays, etc. So people would ask me, how long have you been at Stagsy White Cellars? <laughs> Five months and a week. <laughs> so, but anyway, one of them, and there were always really interesting interviews because it was as if we went on mental frontage roads. For example, one day I came in for an interview and he said, would you mind coming with me to look at a vineyard? And he just wanted me, he wanted to see how I would evaluate a vineyard. We were driving up Soda Canyon Road uh, to see Jan Krupp's home ranch. And he was driving like a bat out of hell, as John was, John was mentioning, and uh, in his uh, uh, um, ultimate vineyard machine, his BMW six-speed 540i. And all of a sudden he pulls over to the side of the road and he stares at me and he said, ask me, would you like a cup of coffee? And I said, sure. So he reaches in the pocket of his brown cardigan and puts three coffee beans in my hand and away we go. <laughs> and I popped, I, I popped a bean in my mouth and I said, Warren, when I was at uh, King Estate, there was a young, young man from New Zealand named Ray Walsh. And he was studying viticulture and enology through correspondence courses. And we, had, we did a Beatles week once, which was um, an eight day week, uh, three 40 hour shifts. And this young man had so much energy, I was finally figured out the source of his energy it was chocolate-covered espresso beans. Warren says, ah, chocolate-covered espresso beans. You put one in your mouth and you feel the chocolate melting on your tongue. You sense the creaminess of the chocolate and the sweetness. And then you bite into the bean and you, there's the astringency and a little bit of bitterness. Now, he's still driving fast, and that's a wavy, windy road. Now he's driving with his knee. He said, and you take this, <laughs> and you separate it, and you evaluate it, the, the, um, you've evaluated intellectually and sensorially, and then you put it back together again, and you evaluate it in its unity. And that's what we want our patrons to do with our wine. So everything was these amazing, mind trips, but it always came back to wine. I noticed, uh, I wasn't, you know, you can't pay attention to everything when you first come somewhere, but I noticed up in block nine by this tree in this rocky pile with sparsely planted vines, these interesting vines that had grapes that looked like teardrops. And I don't know if I asked Julia or Warren first, what are those vines? And they were the Pakistani vines. And I thought they were so interesting, I tasted them, and I asked him if I could make wine from them. And he said, absolutely not, I need the seeds. I said, well, I'll give you the seeds back. <laughs> you know, so, but there, were, they, there weren't a lot of them, so we, we, um, we made the wine in, Erlen, in these small Erlenmeyer flasks, and there was uh, Terry Shapley was working in, in um, public relations, and. Owen Jones, uh, who was hired on the spot because of his boots. Uh, he became the first ever and only executive, uh, uh, no, a state vineyard field sampler. Anyway, I told them, I want you to be very careful with these when you, when you de-stem them. It's almost as if you pluck each one, each berry off, and then crush it gently. So I had forgotten about them. They were in the, um, in the balcony, which somebody, where the Foucault pendulum is. Uh, you call it another, somebody called it a different name. 
Um, six hours later, I said, where are those people? And I went up there, they were still carefully plucking each berry off individually for this wine. So we had um, Erlenmeyer flasks, these little containers in the office, and Warren came in one day and he asked, where's the Pakistani wine? What's right here? And he, you know, the look on his face, how he did it. Look like that and contemplate it. And then he asked if he could taste. Julia got this little disposable pipette, took a drop out and went to him and he looked at her and said, that's all I get? And she said, yes. So he dutifully tipped his head back and she put a drop on his tongue and he said, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, there's so many, um, I walked through the cellar today, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the caves, so many memories here. The bears, the Foucault pendulum, how that came about. The one thing that um, I really appreciate that I learned from Warren, he taught me that every grapevine has a humanistic side. They're all just like us and they deserve the same respect and dignity that we do. They're very precious, like he is. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Warren. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, I, I want to invite uh, Diane Denham and Chris Howell to lectern. I think they're both here, right next to me. Uh, Diane, as I said earlier, has been just an amazing partner uh, and become a good friend who really is one that has uh, made this evening happen. Uh, her relentless commitment to Warren her love for Warren and her realization that um, this was something that would be good for Warren and would be good for everybody that loves Warren. And so thank you again, Diane. Um, Chris, I can't say that many nice things about you, but I will say that. <laughs> But you are so nice to come up here and speak tonight. Uh, Chris is from Kane Vineyard and Winery. And between the two of them, they're going to share the details behind the special surprise that sits in front of each of you that is a gift from Warren. So, Diane? So, I would encourage you all to go ahead and dig into this little gift because a lot of what we have to say is not going to make any sense unless you can see what it is. So I want to just begin by saying it was a long road to get here. I mean, we started talking about doing this event back in the late spring yep. of last year. And um, the original date was set for early November. And as things transpired and Warren had these health issues, um, and we got closer and closer to that date, um, we realized that he probably would not be able to make that date. And so I went to him and I said, Warren, what do you want to do? Because I will say that from the very beginning, he never wanted this to be just about him. He um, was very honored to receive this award 
but he wanted this to be something bigger and he's always somebody who thinks that way. And so Eric and Warren put their heads together and they decided to make this whole thing um, a fundraiser for a cause that is very near and dear to both of their hearts. And um, so here we are raising money for um, the Food History Project. And um, one of the things that I can tell you is that um, Warren is so pleased that you're all here tonight, despite the delays, despite the weather, and that you came out. And um, I'm here partly and mainly to thank you on his behalf for your generosity and for being here. So when you look at this gift, um, some of you will have received something similar if you were at the uh, Smithsonian Medal um, ceremony in, in 2019. Um, but it's something that's so symbolic for him, and, and I love your story about those seeds. Um, so Chris and I are actually going to tell you about this gift um, in Warren's own words. If he can't be here, at least we can hear him. So now I'm quoting from Warren. I was led to think of this gift because our present winemaking grape, Vitis vinifera, is one of the oldest of the cultivated plants from the past. Fossil evidence points to its origins dating to, the, to either the final stages of the tertiary or the beginning of the early quaternary. This means that it is several million years old. Armed with this information, you could surely say it was a good learner about survival, for it has gone through some bumpy times and yet it still has its living progenitors on parts of our earth. Therefore, this gift reflects, I think, the Smithsonian's mission to help us remember the past so that we may better understand ourselves in the present and be mindful of what we pass on to the future. These are Warren's words. As a winemaker, I was led to wonder what the grapes of this original and wild form of Vitis vinifera were like and what kind of wine they would produce. That ancient progenitor, Vitis vinifera sylvestris, is the derivation of all the wondrous and dizzying array of wine grapes we have today. I did eventually make a wine from Vitis vinifera sylvestris. Mm -hmm. I am sorry I could not have you taste that wine today. However, the seeds you see before you are from grapes that made that wine. And I will tell you that while the wine had no fundamental flaws, you could tell by its taste and aroma that Sylvestris could improve. And it did improve. From the artificial and natural selections of breeding that would ultimately bring the qualities and complexities present in all the wines in the Paris tasting, that transformative and revealing tasting organized by my friend Stephen Spurrier in 1976. For now, as you open your small jewelry container, I hope you will feel a sense of the long history of these five seeds and experience a sense of wonder at the outreach of eternity from a plant that is still with us after a journey of more than several million years. So I think we can all agree that that is classic Warren. And um, I, think it's, I think it's important and meaningful that you actually look into your bag and see what's there. And 
I, I, I know most of us are too discreet and too polite to open a gift in presence of the public, but I think this is a meaningful thing. Um, and, you know, it's a beautiful, a beautiful silver box, and you open it up, and what's inside? I want you to see it. So, uh, just, just a, a few more words about that. I think Michael gave us uh, some sense of, of it. I like the idea that Warren tasted the wine through an eyedropper from his daughter. I think that's meaningful. It was good, but it could be improved. So here's Warren. He knew, he will say, I knew Professor Olmo, who specialized in grape genetics at the University of California, Davis. He had a, he had a Guggenheim uh, Fellowship, which took him to Iran and Iraq, ancient Mesopotamia. And he had found Vitis vinifera sylvestris. This means the wild type, pre-human cultivation. And, and he was growing it at Davis. However, there was always that question whether his Mesopotamia area was the furthest eastward origin from where could have this come. Perhaps it might have been found still farther east, towards China, Afghanistan, Pakistan, along the old Silk Road. Think of Warren dreaming of these origins, looking for his past that preceded him in looking for these vines. And so, in the hopes of finding Vitis vinifera sylvestris farther to the east, I proposed to Professor Olmo that we make that expedition along the old Silk Road. And these are the images you're seeing right now. And its upland river and stream valleys, as we searched for any signs of the vegetation that could suggest the viability of wild vinifera, that is, pre-human pre contact, shall we say. Unfortunately, though we didn't find it, we did find other examples of the genus Vitis, and while our own quest was not successful, our belief about a further eastern ero uh, origin of Silvestris, the wild type again, was proven correct. Other seekers found it across a mountain ridge where we had been searching, only about 100 kilometers away, as near as I can tell. So I think it's worth thinking about this, that uh, Warren was on a quest. I think of it as his quest for a, a, a vinicultural Shangri-La. Um, and, and you can see that that quest preceded him, but it was with him all along and still is, even tonight. So, so here we are. We wouldn't be here um, supporting the Julia Child Foundation in honoring Warren if we were not all, each one of us also, on that quest, not just about wine, but about food and wine, each one in our own personal path. So we each have found our way here, I think, tonight, first of all, of course, through the love of Warren, but clearly also through our shared love of food and wine. And I, th I think that really is a meaningful thing. And so when we think of Warren, let's also think about these seeds and think about that quest that is his and now ours as well. And I, I just think you may say, well, how did this guy get here? And uh, some, some few of you know that I, I showed up here absolutely through the love of food and wine. Uh, what most people don't, including Warren, wouldn't know the very first time I showed up, 1982, it was absolutely a pilgrimage to here, Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. And of course, by then, we knew about the Judgment of Paris, but my very first wine book was published before the Judgment of Paris and includes a beautiful interview of Warren. I know I've sent it to Julia at least once, if not more, but uh, it's just, it's just, it's so inspiring. Uh, so, it, 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 you know, he's been there all along. So here are, here's Warren's thought. Put this box somewhere that you will actually see it and think of it, not just of Warren, but think of his quest and our quest, and our, in each one of yours personal quest in your love of food and wine. Um, and we can think about our love here um, of celebrating Julia Child and Warren Muniarski. But we also have to think about how many people came before, what this long chain of continuity is that has gone on, as we now know, for not thousands, but tens of thousands of years. And we're just a bit of it, 
but we can carry it on. So we can know also, as Warren has reminded us, uh, that wine is, and food are not just nourishment, but they can elevate, they can elevate us and illuminate our spirit. So there. Okay. Uh, Warren takes us on an intellectual journey every time we, we talk about him and with him. Um, we've reached the end of this special night. Uh, you're welcome to stay as long as the coffee and wine continues. Um, but I want everybody to, uh, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight, sharing their love for Warren and supporting the Food History Project at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Um, I'm so blessed to have Warren as a friend and meet new friends because of my friendship with Warren. So it would be Michael and John and, and uh, John and everybody else here. Um, it has been a special night and I hope that we all remember that this way and I wish you all a Happy, healthy rest of the year. And as um, Chris said, let's keep that gift from Warren on our desk or somewhere where we see it every day. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.